Hey everybody, welcome back. This is going to be our second lecture in the series on environmental science. We're going to talk about matter and energy in environmental systems. We have a lot to cover, so let's go ahead and just jump right in. The study of matter and energy is a major focal point in a field of science called chemistry. So what chemistry is, is that's the discipline that studies uh, types of matter and how they uh, and how they interact with one another. So the question, of course, is then what is matter? So what we mean by matter is all material in the universe that has mass and occupies space. In other words, you. This table that I've got, this computer that I'm recording off of, that it's sitting on. Uh, the air around me, it has mass, it occupies space. The water that you drink in your cup, the uh, interstellar dust, asteroids, everything around you that has any kind of mass and occupies space, that's matter. Um, that leads us to a kind of an important concept, the law of conservation of matter. The law of, of conservation of matter says matter can be transformed from one type of substance into others, but it cannot be destroyed or created. So for all day-to-day -day operations in our lives, you can't destroy matter. Uh, there's things that we can do to convert it into energy and things like this, and that's kind of going to be going beyond the scope of this class. But the law of conservation matter basically says that if you have something that is of some amount of mass and you distribute it in some complicated way, all you're doing is simply taking that mass and moving it out somewhere else. You're not destroying it. You're unable to destroy it. Um, but you can convert it into other things. And so one place where this kind of happens in space are these uh, are in exploding stars. This is uh, something called the uh, Crab Nebula which was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, there's some really nice caption down here if you want to pause it and read about it. But basically, there's a whole lot of stuff going on in here. And what we see is the creation of new matter that is being thrown out of this star. Uh, and we're going to find, as we go through this little lecture, that a lot of the stuff that we are is actually stardust, things that were thrown out of exploding stars, just like what we see happening here in the Crab Nebula. Um, now, because the matter, or because the amount of matter stays constant, remember we can't get rid of it, we can't create it. It tends that it, it tends to be recycled in nutrient cycles and ecosystems, and therefore we cannot simply wish pollution and waste away. So once it's created, we have to do something with it. We either have to chemically treat it, alter it into another type of matter that is more acceptable, or into a more usable form, or it just becomes a major problem. So let's go ahead and begin then with what the fundamental elements of matter are. And so when we start with the word element, well, there it is. An element is a fundamental type of matter. Um, it's a chemical substance with a given set of properties. It can, you know, it can be, it could get hot really easily. It could be, uh, light can shine through it. It might be a liquid at room temperature. It might be a solid at room temperature. It has a set of properties. Um, right now, there are 118 that are known to have existed on Earth, 94 of them naturally, which means that human beings in labs have made the others. And essentially, all of these fundamental pieces of matter, these 118 different versions of it, different varieties that we find on Earth, um, all are composed of these things called atoms. So uh, I'm sure you've heard about atoms since you were in third grade, but we're going to go ahead and build the atom out because you're going to realize that once you have the atom put together, you can actually stack some really interesting knowledge on top of that. And we're hoping to kind of finish up with some pretty good uh, understanding. So atom is the smallest components that maintain an element's chemical properties. And it contains two parts. It has a nucleus. So here in this image here, we have a nucleus and an electron cloud. This is a uh, a bunch of electrons whirling around. Electrons, unlike the nucleus, the nucleus is positively charged. The electron cloud is negatively charged. And uh, what we see here is, is that when you have a negative and a positive next to each other, opposites attract. And so you have the electrons, which are interestingly trying to avoid each other because they all have the same negative charge, uh, but they're all attracted to this nucleus. So they're kind of buzzing around this thing, almost like flies in a, in a kind of a complicated way. We're going to get into uh, the exact pathways here momentarily. So an atom's nucleus, which is where we're going to start building this atom, is the center, right? And in it, it has two particles. It has protons and neutrons. Now, the protons are positively charged particles, and the neutrons are uh, lack electric charge at all. In other words, they're neutral. They have nothing. So when we look at a 
at a nucleus, and this is kind of an example of a nucleus, um, what we can see is that some of these things are going to be neutrons and some of these are going to be protons. And I believe in this case, the atomic uh, nucleus showing the compact bundle of two types of nucleons, protons are in red. Yes, re red is the protons and ne neutrons are blue. So the whole nucleus is going to be controlled by the protons because the neutrons have no electric charge at all. Okay, so it also contains almost all of the atom's mass. We're going to get into electrons in a moment, but the electrons have almost nothing to contribute in terms of the mass. It does have mass, but it's very, very small. So the atomic number uh, of the atom itself is the number of protons. So you could come in, you can count the protons. Let's assume that all the red ones we see in here are, in fact, uh, protons uh, that we can see. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, that would make it a, a, a atomic number six provided I'm seeing all of them, which would make this carbon. Um, the, atomic, the atomic mass is the number of protons plus neutrons. So that gives us the entire mass of the whole thing. And what we're going to do is we can come through and we can add them all up. And it looks like there's some neutrons that are artistically being hidden, so we're not going to go through that exercise. But you get the idea. All right. So oxygen has eight protons. So it would have an atomic number of eight and um, it commonly has eight neutrons. Not always, but commonly does. So eight plus eight is 16, so the atomic mass is 16, and that's how that works. Um, is it possible to have more neutrons? Sure, we're gonna get into that in a moment. Um, if you have more neutrons, the atomic mass goes up, but if the protons stay the same, it's still oxygen. It doesn't matter how many neutrons it has. It's still oxygen uh, because the atomic number of oxygen is always eight. In fact, that's what defines oxygen is the eight protons. All right, so we kind of hinted at this going for, uh, on the last slide, uh, but what we're gonna see here is, is that we have different kinds of nuclei that, a, that an element may have. So uh, these things called isotopes. The word iso in Greek means same, and tope means type, so it means same type. It's just a fancy word that means same type. So isotopes are atoms of the same element or same type of element, right? isotope with different numbers of neutrons. Uh, so oxygen, we just mentioned this, oxygen has two common stable isotopes. Um, it has O16, which is eight protons and eight neutrons, and O18, which is eight protons and 10 neutrons. And so here's a nice image uh, showing uh, what O16 and O18 look like when you spin them around. Um, Isotopes of an element can behave differently in nature because of their mass differences. And we're going to get into that a little bit later on. Um, it helps you track how things move through systems. And isotopes also have another thing. They could be stable or unstable. So oxygen, these are the two stable oxygens here. Uh, but they can also be unstable. Um, so if they're unstable, they tend to be radioactive. And we'll be covering that more in a few slides. All right, so let's get to these things called electrons. Now, the electrons are negatively charged particles. They're very, very small. Um, they're surrounding the nucleus, and they basically, we, we could say they go in orbit, they surround, or they fly around, or however you want to think of it. But what they're really doing is they're zooming around, um, and they're maintaining some type of energy um, equilibrium with the, with the nucleus, they're, they're maintaining that energy equilibrium with the other electrons and also with the environment in which they are situated. So what they do is they tend to find these things called orbitals, right? So we're going to get into orbitals here in a moment. Um, but essentially, here we have a, I believe this is uh, oxygen again. So here's an oxygen nucleus. This is an animated GIF, which I really, really like these things. Um, and what we see is there's two electrons in close and surrounding it are another six uh, in the next layer out. Now, of course, you can only fit so many electrons in close before they start to have, they're, they're too close to each other that they start to reject each other. So you wind up getting these, these layers. But the, when we think of these layers, we don't really think of them as rings. So this is actually kind of inaccurate. It's a good concept, but it's inaccurate. What really happens is they buzz around almost in a three dimensional, well, it is in a three dimensional, like a shell. Um, and these shells can do very interesting things. They could actually be circular. Uh, they can form almost like bowling pins and they can zoom in and out. And so what we see down here are the uh, location of the shells that uh, electrons can follow in element number 118, which is the largest one we have, which means it also has the potential for the largest number of 
electrons. And each one of these surfaces that we see in here, some of them are nice and spherical, some are not. Some are making figure eights. Uh, here's another figure eight type uh, shell coming in through here. This is one where it's almost forming like a clover leaf. Uh, also, uh, we see a, a, a similar situation happening here with the reds back here. Anyways, the main thing is, is that the electrons basically are, are found on these surfaces around these atoms. So this is an extremely complicated series of shells, but the reason why I put this up here is because we can see how complex they all are. For a single nucleus to have 118 protons, which is a tremendous number of protons, and then to have 118 electrons in theory buzzing around this thing, they have to have some stable arrangement where they can be. And it turns out that it exists, and that's what these electron shells do. And so we call these orbitals because they're not really going in circles. They're, they're orbiting the nucleus while at the same time avoiding each other. It's a really complicated uh, symphony of motion that tends to happen around the nucleus. So that's what electrons are. And so they're basically in these, these shells around the nucleus, which would be situated somewhere right in the very center. All right. Now, fortunately for us, um, we don't always deal with very large elements like element 118. Uh, when we deal with smaller elements, it's easier to see some of the concepts. And one of these concepts that would be hard to see with a large element like 118, but we can see easily with smaller elements like sodium, so sodium is element number 11, is this concept called an ion. So an ion is an atom that gains or loses an electron and becomes electronically charged or electrically charged. Um, so the idea is, is that you want to balance your charges, right? If you have 10 protons, or in this case, 11 protons, I'll just go ahead and stay with sodium. If you have 10 or 11 uh, protons and you want to balance that with 11 uh, electrons, right? So 11 and 11 make zero, right? A positive 11 plus a negative 11 is zero, okay? The problem is, is that nature doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes in an element like sodium, you can see how we have these orbitals set up. Again, this is not exactly accurate, but you get the idea. Here we've got two in the center. This is completely occupied. There's no place else to put an electron and still keep the situation happy. We can put out here another series of electrons. This one turns out is completely full. So we have one out here on the outside. It's almost uh, you know, it's almost an orphan all by itself. It's doing its own thing. Um, it turns out that this particular one here, and I like the word orphan in this case, in the sense that it could be adopted by yet another atom. So when that happens, another atom can come in and give it a better home. Um, it'll pluck this electron away. And then all of a sudden we'll have an electron imbalance. And so when that happens, you get something called an anion or a cation. So an anion are atoms that have gained extra electrons. This is, this is an atom that has come in and said, I have extra room, I'll go ahead and take on an extra electron, even though it makes me a charge imbalance, it's fine, I'm happy to take that electron. Um, in in uh, the case of sodium, chlorine is a, is a, is a typical um, place where that electron will go. So that's why you get things like sodium chloride working together so closely. They're sharing, or they're, I'm just to even say they're sharing, they're donating that electron to chlorine. So chlorine is a common anion. Cations are atoms that have lost some electrons and therefore have a net positive charge. So once you lose this, this whole thing goes positive. Okay, so that makes it a, as I said, an ion. It's a charged atom. All right, so we have a pretty good idea now of what ions are, what atoms are, um, and a lot of the stuff is review that you've known for a long time. One of the things that I really like to cover just a little bit as we're going through this is something called the periodic table of the elements. Now you've heard about it and most people, their eyes roll back in their heads and they don't wanna know about it. It's, it's just kind of an annoying chart full of a lot of data that chemists force you to learn and it's just one of those necessary evils of chemistry. Um, the way that I like to present it is, um, that it's really more of a chart that demonstrates the origins of everything around you. So the periodic table uh, lays everything out first off by atomic number, right? So element number one, which is hydrogen. Element number two is helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and so on and so forth. All the way down to this is uranium, neptunium, and plutonium right here. Um, these 
are the main elements that we deal with in life or in industry or in economics, right? We see all of these things, uh, gold, silver, copper, zinc, cadmium, mercury, okay? Here's lead over here. Um, what's really interesting is this whole thing actually has a nice structure. It turns out that all of the things over here on this very far left column tend to be cations with a positive one charge. Whereas everything over here, uh, the fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, all the way down here, well, not down all the way to here, but this row right here, um, these all tend to be a minus one charge or negative one charge. These are your anions. So here's your plus ones, here's your plus twos in this row here. So calcium is typically a plus two. Hey, guess what? These are typically minus twos, right? And so what we're seeing is that one side is actually commonly matched with the opposite side. And it goes right across the table this way. Uh, what I really like about this uh, table and the one that I have here is that it shows the origins of atoms, right? So it turns out that the original formation of the solar system, not just the solar system, actually the formation of the entire universe was mostly two elements, hydrogen and helium. But when we go out and we study the origins of where matter comes from by using astronomy and, and, and studying dying stars or exploded stars or where these things might be coming from, what we realize is that there's certain origins that come about. And some of them, the original Big Bang, uh, for example, probably produced all the hydrogen and helium. But a lot of the other stuff probably came from things that have happened since then. So, for example, uh, dying low mass stars probably gave us a large amount of our carbon and nitrogen. Um, same thing through here, right? Anywhere where you're seeing green on this chart, and you'll actually see the percentage or the, the approximate percentage is represented by how green it is, right? Um, that's how much is coming from low, uh, low mass stars. Um, then you have exploding massive stars. This tends to give you your ones with the yellow elements. Your exploding white dwarfs, these tend to give you the white elements, right? So chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, things like this. Uh, merging neutron stars, these tend to give you the very large um, uh, atomic mass elements, your uranium, um, gold, silver, things like this. And of course, uh, there's no human, or, or human synthesis is the only thing that creates certain other elements. And we see those in here, uh, marked in gray. And, you know, I think it's a really interesting chart because it really demonstrates that most of us, uh, most of the elements that we're from are, are usually carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, sodium, mag uh, magnesium, aluminum, silica. These are all from exploding massive stars or from dying low mass stars for the most part. And some of it with the Big Bang. So when people say that you're made out of stardust, they're not lying. That's pretty much what you are. That's the origins of those particular atoms. Okay, so, um, and the origins of an element depend strongly upon the atomic number of that element. So we can just map the two together. That's what I like about this version of the periodic table. All right, so we talked a, a little bit earlier about isotopes. I'm going to come back to that a little bit, this concept of radioisotopes. So radioactive isotopes or radioisotopes decay until they become non-radioactive stable isotopes. So if you have an isotope, of an element, and it can be any element. Uh, it can be hydrogen, for example. Um, if it's got an unstable isotope, and in fact, hydrogen does have an unstable isotope called tritium, um, it will decay. It will become another form and will do so through emitting high energy radiation of some sort. There's three different common forms of it. So it'll emit that high energy radi radiation. Uh, this radiation is called ionizing radiation because it generates ions when it strikes other atoms. And in fact, that's what we're seeing happening here. This is a, a piece of uranium ore. And as we know, uranium is uh, radioactive. Uh, so radioactivity is happening around this piece of uranium ore. It's in a cloud chamber. And basically, whenever it shoots out a bit of high energy radiation in a direction, it creates a cloud wisp that you can see. And we can document how radioactive this, uh, this item is visually by looking at a cloud chamber. And by the way, you can make your own cloud chamber. There's ways on YouTube, go online. You can learn about how to make them in your own house. Um, anyways, just as a side note, um, this leads us to kind of an interesting concept called half-life. 
So a half-life is the amount of time it takes for one half of the atoms to give off radiation and decay. Um, so it turns out different items or different elements have different half-lives. So, uh, you know, you might have a half-life that ranges from fractions of a second to billions of years. Um, for example, uranium-235, which is used in commercial nuclear power, it's also used in nuclear weapons, has a half-life of 700 million years. So over about 700 million years, the amount of uranium-235, if I was to have a block of it, half of it would convert into a stable isotope, right? And if I can remember, it's, it's lead. Um, so uranium-235 will convert into lead over that 700 million year period of time, half of it. But then over the next 700 million years, you would think, well, then doesn't that occupy the other, the other half? The answer is no, it takes half of the half. So after 1.4 billion years or, or, or 700 million times two, right? Um, what happens is I've halved the half again. So now that I have 25% uranium-235 and three quarters of it is now lead or 75%. So that's how that works. All right. So atoms do some really interesting things uh, in their interactions. Now they bond to form molecules and compounds. And again, this is something you've known about since you were probably in third or fourth grade. And we're gonna talk about the nuances of this a little bit, because it turns out it's actually pretty important. So atoms bond because of an attraction for each other's electrons. So basically we have these nuclei, right? These atoms, uh, say oxygen or nitrogen or whatever it is. In this case, we have hydrogen. These are hydrogen atoms in here. Um, and they're basically bonded to each other because they're trying to deal with each other's electrons. They're attracted to the electrons that the other one has. So in some bonds, atoms share electrons equally. So if we follow this image right here, this animated GIF, uh, we can see that these electrons are spending an equal amount of time around each one of these nuclei. So it's equally shared, right? Um, and of course, the way that these GIFs are, uh, it kind of shows them always as these nice little balls going around uh, a nice stable nuclei. Uh, the reality is, is again, these, these two electrons are trying to avoid each other. So they'll They'll separate, they'll stay close uh, to the nuclei as much as possible, and then the other one will push it away. So really, this is more accurate. It's actually more of a buzzing. And you can actually see that sometimes they're both on the same uh, hydrogen for a little while, but then they jump over to the other one. And essentially, the electrons are chasing each other off, while at the same time being attracted to a nucleus somewhere nearby. And that's exactly what's going on. And in fact, this way understates it. This is happening extremely fast. Um, in terms of what's going on. Um, so this is if they're sharing it uh, equally. Now, some atoms, they don't share them equally. For example, in the case of water. So in the case of water, oxygen attracts the hydrogen electrons much more strongly than hydrogen can. Now, you know, hydrogen is just a little tiny atom. It's one proton. Oxygen has got eight protons. While it already has eight electrons of its, of its own, it can still attract two more easily. And so what we see here in this image is a water molecule. Uh, here we see the electrons buzzing around, but you can see that even the ones that go around the hydrogens are still shown to spend most of their time around the oxygen. So, you know, the hydrogens get involved. It's, a co it's what we're gonna call a covalent bond, right? This is, so a covalent bond is where electrons are shared between atoms. That's what we see down here. It's an important vocabulary term for this class. Uh, so we're seeing two different kinds of covalent bonds where we have equal sharing up here with the hydrogens and unequal sharing down here with water, where the uh, oxygen uh, takes advantage of, this, of the inability of the hydrogen to hold onto that electron tightly. Um, the electron does spend some time around hydrogen, but not nearly as much as it does around the oxygen. And that's, it turns out, is extremely important in how water behaves. All right, so there are also another kind of bond. We kind of implied this a little earlier. Um, this is where we have complete transference. So we have in ionic bonds, electrons are completely transferred between atoms. So there's no sharing at all. So what we're seeing here is uh, a, a GIF where we see sodium and chlorine, and we'll, we'll wait for it to cycle through. Notice right here, this is gonna transfer to there. That suddenly gives this a negative charge, and that's a positive charge. One more time cycle through. And all of a sudden now the positive and negative sodium and chlorine will form a molecule. They'll actually 
Uh, they'll actually form a, uh, uh, an ionic bond with each other. So ionic compounds are called salts, and an electron is transferred when this happens, so common table salts. So we just explained this. Uh, solutions are, are something that we're also very accustomed to in nature. It's a mixture of substances with no chemical bonding. So this happens with air, it's in ocean water, petroleum, ozone does this as well. So it's, it's pretty common. So anyways, this is an ionic bond where there's no sharing of the electrons, whereas covalent bonds have either equal sharing or partially equal sharing or partially sharing. All right, so let's bring up what we mean by a molecule then. So a molecule is simply combinations of two or more atoms. Uh, oxygen gas, the gas, the oxygen you breathe in from the atmosphere, it turns out, is not pure elemental oxygen. It's actually molecular oxygen. It's O2. Um, and that's a molecule. Okay. So how is that different from a compound? Well, a compound is a molecule composed of atoms of two or more different elements. So uh, oxygen gas is a molecule, but it is not a compound because it's all oxygen. All right. Water, on the other hand, is a compound. This is two hydrogen atoms bonded to one oxygen atom. And that's what we see right up over here. Here's the two hydrogens and here's the oxygen. This is H2O, two different elements uh, represented, or it's actually three atoms, but two different elements represented to make this compound. Carbon dioxide is one carbon atom with two oxygen atoms. And that's what we see right here. Here's the carbon in the center, oxygen's on the sides. And then glucose, this is uh, a very simple sugar. Uh, glucose is six carbon atoms bound with six oxygen and 12 hydrogen atoms. And this is what that looks like. Okay, definitely another compound. And we're going to be talking about glucose quite a bit here shortly. All right, so I mentioned earlier that water has some pretty interesting characteristics. So water, it turns out, is a polar molecule caused by unequal sharing of bonds in its covalent, or uh, I'm sorry, unequal sharing of electrons in its covalent bond. So remember, we've mentioned that it's unequal. Therefore, the area around the hydrogen, it turns out is slightly positive because it doesn't get all the electron uh, visitation that it wants, right? So it's slightly positive, whereas the oxygen is slightly negative. So that means that it's kind of strange uh, right, kind of ironic is while it has its own hydrogen, each oxygen has also got a slight uh, electric uh, charge or electric, or uh, I'm sorry, a slight bonding charge towards other molecules of water. And so this oxygen here will then bind to hydrogens through something called a hydrogen bond. You can see it right here because this blue part is negative and the green parts are uh, positive. And that's important because that brings about something called uh, uh, a water tension, right? So water's strong cohesion allows transport of nutrients and waste, and without it, most of the systems that we take advantage of in life uh, would, wouldn't work very effectively, if at all. Also, this is important, water absorbs heat with only small changes in its temperature. It stabilizes water, uh, organisms, and climate. Uh, think about this, right? When you when you take a pot of water and you put it on the stove and you're going to go, I don't know, make, make some spaghetti or whatever. Um, but when you put that pot of water on the stove and you turn it on, you could turn that water on over the heat and walk away from it. And it probably take, in some cases, 15, 20 minutes for it to start to boil if it's a large pot of water. Um, that means you're pumping a lot of energy in. Um, the oceans are this way, right? There's a tremendous amount of energy that is piped into the oceans every single day from the sun and then it's radiated back out every evening. So it, that's what we're talking about, stabilizing of climate. Water has this ability to do it because it can store that energy in its bonds. We're going to get into uh, energy in a little bit, but that's how that happens. All right, another thing that happens um, is that water has a really cool... Um, feature to it, which is that it is less dense um, and as ice than it is as liquid water. Um, this is really unusual. Um, most, most things, think about a, a block of iron. If you take a block of iron, you throw it into molten iron, you expect the iron to sink, and it does. Same thing with gold, same thing is true with silver, but water's different. 
the solid form of itself actually floats in the liquid form of itself. This is really interesting. And so what that means is that in the wintertime, lakes will freeze over on the surface, but there'll be liquid water down below, and that tends to insulate the water below. So the ice tends to float and cause an insulation, and that, that creates a large um, protection or a, a major protection for that ecosystem in a lake. So water dissolves other molecules that are vital for life, of course, as well. And so all of that through the hydrogen bonds uh, is, is possible. Now we got to bring up hydrogen and hydrogen ions because hydrogen ions really are just protons. That's really what they are. Uh, so hydrogen ions, uh, hydrogen is element number one. It's one proton with one electron. And so if it's an ion, it means it doesn't even have the electron. We're just talking about a proton. So that leads us to the idea that we might have some rogue protons, just like we have rogue electrons moving around the environment. And sure enough, we do. And it turns out keeping track of those is really a big deal. Okay, so the way we keep track of it is through something called the pH scale. So the pH scale quantifies the acidity of solutions. So that measurement of how many protons are in a system or how many loose protons are in a system is what we call the pH scale, something you've probably heard about your whole life but didn't really know what that was a measurement of. And it ranges from uh, 0 to 14. It's a logarithmic scale. We're going to get into this momentarily, but uh, don't worry about where the 0 or the 14 comes from. Um, just know that the common numbers that we use are from 0 to 14. Um, acidic solutions have a pH of 7. Um, and so when we look at the scale here, this goes from, we'll go from 0. It can even go negative, by the way. Um, and then it can even go beyond 14. But again, these are the common ranges that we're dealing with here. And seven is freshly distilled water, or what we call neutral water. Um, and so anything that is acidic has a pH of less than seven. So seven all the way to zero, and even into the negative numbers, um, that's all acidic. And as you move away from seven up into this direction, it gets really acidic. So it turns out milk is slightly acidic. Egg yolks have a, a pH of about six and a half. Uh, pure rainwater that falls out of the sky, usually about uh, five and a half. Um, beer is about four and a half. Orange juice, three and a half. Vinegar at three. Carbonated beverages, two and a half. Lemon juice is two. Okay. Battery acid is about zero. It's actually slightly negative. So we're dealing with some really dangerous stuff when we get up here. Gastric fluid, this is stuff in your hydrochloric acid in your stomach. Um, it breaks down uh, tissues and it breaks down things that you eat, but it's extremely um, uh, reactive um, stuff. Now, you can go the other way. Seawater, typical seawater is a little over 8. Baking soda solution is a little over 8, about 8.2. Um, milk of magnesia, this is stuff you put in your stomach to settle your stomach. This is a, a pH of about 10.5. Uh, household ammonia, this is this is a cleaning agent. This gets pretty dangerous. This is about 11 and a half. Household bleach, almost 13. Lye, um, this stuff can get really dangerous. These are really dangerous solutions. Uh, just like what you're seeing over here, this is really dangerous. This can get really dangerous and, and, uh, and very poisonous. Uh, one of the features that's kind of interesting with um, the pH scale is, is that as you go into the basic solutions from pH greater than 7, from 7 to 14 and greater, the, the substances, especially if it's water-based, those substances tend to get very slick and slippery. This is why seawater, if you've ever been to the beach, feels slippery compared to the water you get out of the tap, for the most part. Um, if you happen to live in Southern California where the water tends to not go over carbonate rocks, carbonate rocks tend to move the pH up into the slightly basic area right around here with seawater. Um, if you live in the Southern California or anywhere along the West Coast, for the most part, your water is going to be a pH of about five and a half. Um, so if you're somebody that lives in Southern California but moves to somewhere where there's a lot of carbonate rocks, um, where the water is tends to be um, more alkaline, more basic, one of the ways that you can treat that water is to take a little lemon or a little juice or something like this and pour it in. You'll see uh, at a lot of restaurants, they'll put a little lemon in there to freshen that water up. And what that does is it lowers the pH and it makes it feel refreshing again. Um, so anyways, the, the pH scale, which per, it's the H stands for hydrogen, is logarithmic. So a substance with a pH of 6 contains 10 times as many hydrogen ions as a substance with a pH of 7. So to go from here to here, 
means that there's 10 times as much hydrogen in that solution. So when you go from uh, pH of, uh, as, uh, see here, in 100 times as much as a pH of 8. So if we were to go from 8 to 6, that's 10 times 10. So that's 100 times more concentrated. Okay, So that's really what we mean by these things. Um, a small change in this number actually reflects a very large difference in the chemistry. All right, so a new idea. We've talked about what compounds are. We've talked about molecules. Let's build on that concept now. Let's talk about organic compounds. And organic compounds are carbon and hydrogen atoms joined by bonds. That's all they are. That's all they are. Now, it can include other things. It can have nitrogen. It can have oxygen, sulfur, phosphorus. Um, a classic uh, example of this would be uh, vitamin B12. So here we see vitamin B12, there's oxygen, there's a little bit of nitrogen and hydrogen, but these points right here are all carbons. Um, we just, there's in fact, there's so many carbons, they don't even mark them. It's just assumed that they're there. So there's a lot of carbon in here, there's a lot of hydrogen in here, there's a lot of nitrogen. Um, let's see here, anything interesting? Cobalt, maybe, is what that is. Um, so it's pretty interesting how big these things can get and how complicated they can get. Um, an inorganic compound, it just simply lacks the carbon to carbon bond. So each one of these, like I said, each one of these little bends is a carbon right here and not there, but here, here, uh, here, 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 here. Those are all carbon. And if you don't have a carbon to carbon bond, it's not an organic compound. It just lacks it. Okay. So that leads us to kind of some building of organic and inorganic compounds, you know, differentiating them. So let's talk about hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are definitely organic compounds. Um, these are hydrocarbons contain only carbon and hydrogen, hence hydro is in hydrogen, carbon. And the simplest hydrocarbon is methane, uh, something that we find common in natural gas. And so here we find carbon. Carbon typically has a plus four charge. So it can attract four hydrogens around it. Um, and then they can link together, right? So if we go from methane, we can add another carbon, we surround them with hydrogens, and now we've got ethane, which is C2H6. We can put in a third one that's propane, that's C3H8. We can put in a fourth one that's butane, C4H10, and so on and so forth. Some of these are gonna be, are, are gonna be uh, uh, things that you've seen before. Uh, you're going to recognize them, I should say, recognizable. Uh, octane, for example, which is C8. Oct, meaning eight. So this is octane. The hydrocarbon chain is eight carbons long. And so we're just looking at carbon chains is what we are. So hydrocarbon can be a gas, liquid, or solid. It turns out the larger the number of carbons, the bigger the changes are going to happen. So C, this is what we call C1, C2, C3, C4. Um, these are all common in natural gas, right? And they're used as gases, right? Um, then we start getting into pentane, uh, hexane, gasoline. This is using gasoline. These are liquids, right? Gasoline, 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 nonane, decane, um, dodecane. And suddenly we're going from gasoline to uh, kerosene and diesel. So we recognize that there's a liquid here, but this is gasoline and it's lighter carbon chain, it's smaller. And once we get up into the higher carbon chains, we start getting diesel and kerosene and jet fuel. Jet fuel is uh, C14. Uh, and uh, again, heating, oil, kerosene, compression, uh, uh, compression ignition, um, and so on and so forth, right? So this is, this is what organic compounds are. And you've, you've got a lot of experience in dealing with them, especially as fuels. Uh, so fossil fuels consist of hydrocarbons, and that's usually what we are doing when our refining process is we're removing these things from the ground, refining them and distributing them for that, the purposes that we're seeing in this list. Now, we need to bring up this concept called a polymer. So sometimes, and we're seeing it right in here, right? We're seeing what appear to be these repeats that happen in here, just to kind of a, as a concept to build these chains. Well, sometimes the chains aren't just carbon on carbon. Sometimes you can take an entire molecule and then you could link molecule onto molecule. 
So a polymer is a long chain of repeated molecules. So carbohydrates, uh, such as uh, which include polysaccharides, of course, are one type of polymer. Well, in fact, carbohydrates are polysaccharides. So RNA and DNA are also types of polymers, and these are the building blocks of life. So we can take a, monosac a monosaccharide, which is glucose, and we can link them. Boom, boom. So there's two glucoses. This creates a disaccharide that you've also heard of in your life called sucrose. Um, so, th but this is basically a polymer of two glucoses put together, right? So this is the chain. We can continue this chain. And when we start doing this, we get a polysaccharide and this is a form of starch. And essentially what we're doing is we're building these things called macromolecules. These are large, large, large size molecules. This isn't small stuff like water, H2O. These are very complicated, very large, single molecules. Um, and there are three types of macromolecules that are, that are polymers that are essential to life. There's proteins, nucleic acids, and carbohydrates, or as you like to call them, carbs. Um, so give you an idea of how these macromolecules work. Here's a, a kind of a small little piece of a polysaccharide. We saw a version of it in the last slide. But you can see that there's a large number of atoms all linked together in this chain, right? And it's repeating, right? Constantly repeating. Now there's also something called lipids. Lipids are not polymers, but are also essential. And this is basically your fat and oil stuff that you have in your body. Uh, fats and oils store energy. Phospholipids are structural components of cell membranes, so it's an important part of your, your, your cells. Um, also, uh, they also produce, or they're also a form of, or steroids also work as hormones, which are biochemical regulators, and these are another important uh, element of your body. Now, in terms of how, in, how big and interesting these things can get, let's talk about proteins a little bit. So proteins are long chains of these things called amino acids. Um, there's 20 amino acids that are necessary for life uh, in, all the, in all life on planet Earth. Um, what we do is we take these amino acids and we use them to stack them together, almost like Legos, to create different things. Um, these different things are created in the cell. Um, using something called DNA. We're going to get into this a, shortly, but not in depth. And you can see pretty quickly how crazy big some of the stuff can get. So here we see an image of a protein. Um, this is a very complicated protein. Um, and a single protein subunit, this is just a single unit that is stacked into it is right here. And you can see it repeats around, right? And so the body builds these things, and then it builds these things on to, to interlink with each other. Hemoglobin is another one where it's another fascinating uh, pro It's actually interlinks of, I believe, four different separate proteins linked together. Um, so proteins, they provide structural support, they store energy, they transport material, they do everything. Uh, animals use proteins to generate skin, hair, muscles, and tendons. Some are components of the immune system or work as hormones. Uh, they can serve as enzymes, molecules that promote chemical reactions. Um, you know, this thing has a, a purpose where it basically comes out and it uh, works on it. This is a protein that molds and fixes other proteins is essentially what this thing does. So your body is just full of proteins. Of course, the instructions for creating proteins comes from your genetics, from uh, what we're going to call the DNA. So, and that leads us to these things called nucleic acids. These are long chains of nucleotides that contain sugar, phosphate, and a nitrogen base. Um, and these nitrogen bases are usually in a what we call a T to A pairing or a C to G pairing. Um, and the two versions of this you're probably most familiar with are DNA, which is deoxo deoxyribonucleic acid and ribonucleic acid, which is RNA, uh, which carry hereditary information of organisms. So you get that from your parents. DNA uh, typically uh, is found in your body is in the form of a double helix. RNA will form a single helix. Um, and so this is what we see in a DNA molecule. This is the structure here. Uh, each one of these here are these nitrogen bases. And this is part of the code. And how these link up, here's your T matched to an A, here's your C matched to a G. 
And what happens is the order or the sequence in which they reside on the DNA is the genetic code. That genetic code is what's uh, coding for proteins. Those are called genes. So the genes are regions of DNA that code for proteins that perform certain functions. So this is, I mean, it all really comes down to these things right here on your DNA. Your body has the ability to read this DNA through a complicated process that I'm not going to have time to get into in this class. But if you take a beginning biology class, you almost certainly are required to learn this process. Um, and it's, it's really interesting. But when we look at it, it's really it's the same stuff that we've been talking about. Hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, phosphorus. You know, it's a giant macromolecule, right? That's, that's what this thing is. Um, it's basically a stacked, it's a new version or new stacking form of this complicated uh, series of molecules that we started with at the beginning of the lecture. All right. In terms of what we mean by uh, ma macromolecules being critical building blocks of life, we've got to get jump into these carbs or carbohydrates, right? We call them carbs. Atoms of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Uh, sugars are the simple carbohydrates. These usually have three to seven carbons in a chain. Um, and glucose provides energy for cells. So it's the, it's the fundamental unit. Um, we usually think of sugars as usually this white stuff or whatever, but these are four different kinds of sugars that we can find uh, at any store. And yes, it's the kind of sugar we're talking about, right? So here we see white refined sugar. This is the white unrefined. Um, this is un or, I'm sorry, unprocessed cane sugar. And here's uh, brown sugar that, again, you can buy all of these at the store. Complex carb carbohydrates build structures and store energy. Starch stores energy in plants. Animals eat plants to get starch, right? That's the process, right? So they, be, they basically, they start to create these carbohydrates. They build them and they store these, this energy inside of their bodies. The starch stores energy in plants. Animals then eat the plants to get the starch, okay? And that's how we wind up with our energy, right? There's different examples here for other places where this is an important uh, carbohydrate, right? Uh, in terms of uh, insects, crustaceans, cellulose, and the cell walls of plants. All right, so that's a lot to cover. And, you know, I kind of understand if you're, you're feeling like, oh, I gotta take a break. So you've gotta pause it and come back to it. That's fine, I understand, I won't be offended. But the main thing is, is we're actually pretty close to being done with this lecture. We do have to introduce energy quickly, okay? So energy is one of those ideas that, uh, because we are we deal with both matter and energy all the time, but energy is not the thing that we deal with physically. It's the thing that we interact with, but not usually in a physical sense. Um, so energy is the capacity to change the position. You know, for example, if you take a brick and hold it over your head, you change that position. Um, physical composition or temperature of matter. So if you take that brick and you let it go, Right, it's going to fall. It's going to change its position. So that's that's energy. That's what we're talking about. Involved in physical, chemical, biological process. It's in everything. It's in everything. It's all around you. You can't. If you've got matter, you've got energy. They're always together. So potential energy is the energy of position. Again, that whole idea of taking a brick and lifting it over your head. But it turns out nuclear energy and mechanical energy are both versions of potential energy. Um, if it's mechanical energy, think about um, the way that an engine runs, right? That's actually a form of chemical energy. But the way that an engine runs, right, you, you basically you operate a piston by exploding gasoline and air inside of that piston. And that motion on that piston is what's driving the car, right? That's mechanical energy. Nuclear energy is the, it turns out that the nucleus of all these uh, atoms that we've been studying since the beginning of this lecture all those little protons don't really like being close to each other. Just like the electrons don't like to be close to each other, neither do the protons. But there's a special force called the nuclear force that binds a nucleus together. But if we're able to somehow get the disrupt the nucleus so, such that some of those protons are able to creep way far enough from, that, from the uh, nucleus, maybe hit it hard enough or shear it hard enough, all of a sudden some of those, those protons will separate out very rapidly because there's a very strong repulsive force amongst the protons. And if that happens, then you get a nuclear explosion. Okay, So that's another form of potential energy. It's the energy of position, right? If the protons are close together and they're being overcome by that force, then it, 
then nothing happens. But if they're able to get far enough away, if there starts to be enough instability, things will creep out and all of a sudden it will explode. Uh, kinetic energy is the energy of motion. So thermal, light, sound, electrical, subatomic particles, um, that's all kinetic energy. It's, it's, the, it's how things move, right? Anything that's moving, we recognize that. Here, what we see here is a form of kinetic energy, right? And then, of course, there's chemical energy. Chemical energy is potential energy held in the bonds between atoms. Think of TNT, right, dynamite. So if you have some TNT and you blow it up, then those chemical bonds suddenly separate very rapidly, and that expansion is where all the chemical energy is. All right, so when it comes to energy, we have to be aware of the fact that there's some rules we got to follow. There's just no way around it. Uh, there's two important rules we need to be aware of whenever we're tracking how energy operates. This is an important, uh, these are important concepts as we go forward because sometimes it, a solution to a problem might seem pretty obvious until you realize that uh, the laws of thermodynamics uh, don't let us do this. So what are these rules? The first law of thermodynamics, one is that energy can change forms but cannot be created or destroyed. Classic example of this is demonstrated in this diagram that we have here. This is a, a roller coaster, and as the roller coaster goes up that initial ramp, we'll see it here in a minute, it builds up its potential energy, which we can see on this bar over here. So it'll build up its potential energy, and then as it moves down, it'll convert it into kinetic energy. And what we're seeing is as it moves up and down, it's sliding it between potential and kinetic energy, and that's what makes a roller coaster work, is we can never destroy the energy itself. All we can do is convert it from one type into another, okay? That's rule number one, the first law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics is a little more subtle and a little harder to understand for some people, so we're just going to kind of quickly hit it. And if you want a deeper explanation, I'll give you a link for where you can go to get that information. So the second law of thermodynamics is that energy changes from a more ordered uh, to a less ordered state. Uh, that's energy itself. It's not matter, it's energy that does this. Energy tends to diffuse or to, to move out into, into open or, or into new opportunities, let's put it, let's put it that way. So uh, the, the notion of this is called entropy. It's an increasing state of disorder, or that's how it's defined in, in many of the textbooks anyway. Um, the real concept is actually a little bit more complicated and it's actually a lot more complicated and it's much subtler and sometimes it's better, under, uh, better understood using a little mathematics. But a kind of a simple understanding of it is a, you know, this campfire. This campfire that we see in the middle of the screen here that's, that's burning is burning wood. That wood is, uh, is taking uh, through this chemical reaction is taking itself from a more ordered fashion to a more disordered fashion, right? It's producing carbon dioxide, heat, energy, light uh, is being released. Uh, the physical aspect of the wood is being converted into ashes. Um, it's very difficult to go back the other way. It's not reversible, right? It's, it, it takes, uh, you can't take all the exact same thing and put it back and not lose energy. It takes millions of times, probably billions of times more energy to actually reconstitute that than it is to just simply burn it. So that's what they mean by that increasing state of disorder. It's really in the energy domain that that happens. Uh, the best explanation I can find for it online is put together by Sal Khan. Uh, Sal Khan uh, has a wonderful online platform called Khan Academy and he he's, does a wonderful job of going through it. Here's the uh, YouTube link right here uh, if you ever want to go check it out or you could probably just search for it on YouTube. Um, so inputting energy from outside the system is required to overcome entropy. So if you're going to be losing energy, it means you got to bring in energy from somewhere else. And that's, that's the game that we're playing as living organisms. All right, so in terms of energy, some things are easier for us to harness and to utilize than other things. So an energy source... Na uh, energy sources nature determines how easily or, uh, energy can be harnessed. So for example, fossil fuels provide concentrated energy. You can get a tremendous amount of work done from a gallon of gasoline, right? Whereas sunlight, on the other hand, is spread out and difficult to harness. So that's the reason why we have fossil fuel powered cars, but we don't really have that many solar powered cars. The way that we take advantage of solar power is, is that we have a diffuse light collector, maybe a, I don't know, a, a, so, a series of solar panels on our roof that then charge a battery. And then that battery concentrates that energy for us. And then we put the battery inside of the car. Uh, so that's how our new technology, the, the, the Tesla company, for example, uh, is making fast cars using just batteries 
that can potentially run entirely off sunlight. Um, but it's a, it's, you can see it's a two-step process. We don't put the solar panels on the car because the car doesn't have enough uh, area to be able to acquire uh, all the required um, uh, energy. The energy conversion uh, efficiency is the ratio of useful energy output to the amount needed to be input. So in terms of running a car, so 16% of the energy released from gasoline is used to power the automobile. The rest is lost as heat. Um, that's a large amount of inefficiency in a automobile, right? 84% of it is just lost as heat and we can't use it for anything. Um, in fact, we just expel it out of tailpipe or it goes through the radiator. Um, in terms of an incandescent light bulb, these are the old school light bulbs, they get really, really hot. Only 5% of it was used to actually produce light. Uh, here's an incandescent light bulb right here to demonstrate flickering. Um, that means 95% of it is used for heat. So you can imagine in, on a hot summer day when you need lights, uh, that you would the air conditioning unit would be having to overpower the lights inside that house. And so probably a better way to go is to use LED. Right, so LED, while it requires a very low amount of energy to, to power the same light bulb, um, it also produces a lot less heat. So that means that it has a benefit to other systems like your heating and air conditioning in your house. So you're not hitting yourself twice um, just because you want to turn on a light bulb or two. Well, it turns out that plants take advantage of this exact same thing in terms of energy. The sun releases energy in a large energy spectrum across the entire solar system. It's everywhere, right? Um, and we're going to talk about this. Uh, but if you go all the way out to Pluto, you can still see the sun. It's very, very, very faint compared to on the Earth. But there's still solar energy that's really released all the way to Pluto. Okay, so it's across the entire solar system. Solar energy drives weather and climate and powers uh, plant growth. It's, it's the source of this, right? It's where it all comes from. Without the sun, nothing else works. Um, when we get into uh, talking about solar power and the connection between living things, we have to bring up the concept of an autotroph, which is a primary producer. Um, these are organisms that produce their own food, such as green plants, algae, cyanobacteria. Uh, we see over here white clovers, which are in this photograph, which are basically doing the same thing. These are essentially, these leaves here are essentially solar arrays that are carrying out a process called photosynthesis. So photosynthesis is the process of turning the sun's diffuse light, right, uh, just like those solar panels on your house, uh, the diffuse light energy into concentrated chemical energy. And so what it does is it takes that diffuse energy coming from the solar, from the sun, and it's concentrating it into glucose molecules. So we're gonna show you how that happens here in a moment. The solar radiation that's coming in, this is the, the, the solar spectrum at sea level, we can see that most of this energy that's coming in is in the visible spectrum. So the height of it shows how much energy we have in terms of wattage per square meter. Uh, we have a little bit of ultraviolet. We have a considerable amount of infrared, but it still pales by comparison with the visible spectrum. So the visible spectrum is the stuff that we see outside. These are what we interpret uh, if you're not colorblind or you have some type of handicap. Uh, this is what you would uh, interpret as red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, or violet. Um, and uh, infrared, most human beings cannot see. There are, it does turn out there are some organisms that can see both in the UV or the infrared. Um, human beings, for the most part, cannot. Um, but this is how we interpret these colors. And down here are the, are the wavelengths. So this is the wavelength of the energy, the electromagnetic radiation that's coming to the Earth. Um, and so we can see that the visible spectrum kind of resides between 380 and 780 right here. So when we look at plants, it turns out plants have two chemicals, pigments in them called chlorophyll, chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. There's two different kinds. Uh, chlorophyll A, it turns out, absorbs. So this is the absorbance right here. It likes to absorb right around 425 to 430 uh, nanometers. Um, chlorophyll B likes to absorb right up to about 480 nanometers, which means we have good coverage between 400 and 500 nanometers absorbance. In other words, purples and blues tend to get absorbed by chlorophyll A and B. And then there's a big drop. There's very little absorbance that happens between 5 and about 600 nanometers. And right around 600 nanometers, there's a spike in what chlorophyll B picks up. And chlorophyll A then has another spike right around 700 and let's call it 680. What we see here is this spike here and this spike 
they work together to wipe out basically the entire red portion of the spectrum. So chlorophyll is quite good at absorbing all the reds and all the blues, but it turns out it's really good at leaving behind the greens, which is the reason why plants are green, because it essentially reflects the, one, the color spectrum that is not absorbed by, uh, by the chlorophyll. So we're going to get into chlorophyll a little bit here in a moment. So uh, chloroplasts, which are the organelles where photosynthesis occurs, so photosynthesis, remember, is that process. It contains the chlorophyll. So chlorophyll is a light-absorbing pigment that exists within these plants. So there's a light reaction that happens, there's solar energy that happens, and basically what happens is the solar energy interacts with water inside the plant. The light energy splits the water using solar energy, and it introduces it into something called the Calvin cycle. So we're not going to get into the details of this so much here in this lecture, but just know that water goes in, light energy comes in, um, and essentially it's going to combine it with something in the Calvin cycle called carbon dioxide. So here we've got six molecules of carbon dioxide, six molecules of water, plus the sun's energy. It's going to produce one molecule of sugar plus output, so here's our sugar coming out of the Calvin cycle, and it's going to output one or six molecules of oxygen. So water, carbon dioxide, and sunlight come in, oxygen, sugar comes out. All right, so cellular respiration occurs in all living things. So organisms use chemical energy stored from photosynthesis. That's the ultimate starting point. Um, and in fact, if you don't realize how chemical energy can work, even in plants, here we actually see a touch-sensitive plant that is responding to uh, quick touch. And so here we see potential energy in the form of those glucose bonds uh, being released to form kinetic energy as these leaves fold up. And I forget the name of the species of this plant, but I know that it's frequently called the shy. I think it's called the shy plant, or, um, if I can remember. Um, anyways, but the rest of us, we don't produce our own energy. We don't have our own leafy solar panels to be able to produce energy. So we're heterotrophs. Um, heterotrophs are organisms that gain energy by feeding on other things. Uh, animals do this, fungi, microbes, and we're all heterotrophs. The chemical equation for respiration, this is the breakdown of sugar using oxygen, is the exact opposite. So we've got one molecule of sugar, six molecules of oxygen. Uh, we take those things, we combine that oxygen with that sugar, and it breaks down to carbon dioxide plus water plus energy. This is exactly the input from the plant. And this is the input from us, right? So we're basically reversing that process in photosynthesis to get our own energy out of it. So essentially that energy we get from our food is ultimately, that's the same energy that came in from the sun. Uh, now, last but not least is not all organisms live where the sun can reach. Um, so they have to rely on alternative energy sources. Uh, one such, uh, energy source that is plentiful on planet Earth is geothermal energy. Um, and it can power biological communities without any solar contact. It's just a little more sophisticated what happens. Uh, we have these things called hydrothermal vents that exist at the bottom of the ocean. They, we're going to talk a little bit about hydrothermal vents and where they, where they exist uh, in the next lecture. Um, but there's no sunlight down here. When we look at this image over here to the right with the water billowing out of the rock, uh, out of this hydrothermal vent, None of that light is actually from the sun. It's all provided by human beings with their, with their lights down there. These organisms live in, ex in complete darkness. Um, so there's no sun to, to cause photosynthesis, right? So instead they do something called chemosynthesis. This is where they use hydrogen sulfide to produce sugar. So they take um, six uh, molecules of carbon dioxide, six molecules of water, three molecules of hydrogen sulfide, and the net result is sugar, plus three molecules of a chemical called sulfuric acid. So it's, it can be done, um, it's just a, it's a lot more challenging in some of these environments. You need specialized organisms to make this happen. All right, so that leads us into our next lecture, which is gonna be covering planet Earth, which is the canvas on which uh, environmental science happens. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, call, call it quits on this lecture, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.